the Public Utilities Commission. And they have a small department there for the consumers. And uh, very he's small. Very small. <laughs> but he's been taking up the fight of consumers in California uh, for the protection of uh, communication rights. And he's going to give a presentation on uh, net neutrality and the fight in the, in, as far as the legal rights of net neutrality in the Constitution. So, um, without further ado, uh, welcome Chris Witherman. He's also a member of CASE, which is the organization representing lawyers at the state of California. So, welcome Chris Witherman. Uh, thanks, Steve. Thanks for having me. Um, I uh, know Steve for. Hello? Yeah. I've known Steve, how long Steve? 30 years, 25? Um, we first met doing cable access. Uh, and you fast forward 25, 30 years and it's still the same fight to get diverse voices on the electronic networks. Um, you heard this morning about software. Uh, I'm going to talk about the wires. Uh, the wires on which the internet runs. Now there's international aspects of this. I'm sure you've been following what's happening in Syria where they just turned the switch off uh, last day or two. Uh, there's the ITU, the international meeting where uh, certain countries are trying to have that power, censorship power written into law. I'm going to talk about what's happening in this country and very particularly what's happening with what we call the ILACs the incumbent local exchange carriers, AT&T and Verizon, you may know them by those names. Um, on July 2nd of this year, Verizon filed a brief with the United States Court of Appeals District of Columbia Circuit stating that the open network anti-discrimination rules adopted by the FCC, quote, violated Verizon's First Amendment uh, rights by stripping Verizon of control over the transmission of speech on its network. Just think about that for a minute. Verizon also argued that its broadband network was its, quote, microphone and its newspaper and in doing so essentially claimed online communications uh, claimed the online communications of 200 million Amer online Americans including all of you as its own speech so all of this is under the rubric of net neutrality and that's what I'm going to talk about and uh, first, I'm going to give a little background about the wires. What is the internet? Uh, some of you may have heard this before, may have heard it from me before, because uh, part of this is material that I've, I've done before, but a lot of it is new, so bear with me. Um, the internet's a lot of things. It's a physical layer, it's a code layer, it's a content layer. Uh, the physical layers, wires, conduit, and routers. Uh, for policy purposes, I'm only interested in the physical layer because that's where the control is. That's where, that's the architecture that shapes the internet. Um, okay, so, uh, my battle cry is, it's the wires, stupid. For years, uh, the phone companies would come into us. I, I work at the California Public Utilities Commission, as Steve said. I'm in the uh, legal division, in the telco branch of the legal division. Uh, and I hasten to add that my views are obviously my own. Uh, for years, the telephone companies would come in and they would 
uh, have would give us diagrams, and the diagrams would have the public switch telephone network, what we regulated over here, and that would be very clear and wires and all that stuff. And then over on the other side of the page would be the cloud. And this sort of mystification kept people from realizing that the internet runs on the wires. The internet runs on what used to be called the public switch telephone network that was paid for with repair dollars. Okay, so what does this look like? Some of you have seen this slide before. This doesn't really uh, do the original justice when it's blown up in PowerPoint. Uh, this uh, is a map of the internet. The red are the Verizon wires. The blue are the AT&T wires. Green is Bell Canada, I believe. And uh, you can't see it on here, yellow is Quest. And little tiny black squiggles in, in when you see the full document. And you can uh, find this by Googling internet map Lumeta or Lumetra, L-U-M-E-T-A or T-R-A. Uh, a bunch of guys who made this map by sending out tracers from MIT on email and seeing what actual physical routes the, I, the IP packets travel. And when they got the information back, they assembled this map. And it really, I think, graphically illustrates that when we talk about the internet, we are talking about wires that are owned by AT&T and Verizon, for the most part. On a local level, and this is actually, you can see the Bay Bridge going off to the right there. Um, the, these, these are special access lines in downtown San Francisco. Special access is fiber, generally to businesses. It's very high um, uh, capacity, big pipe. Uh, and it also connects a lot of the smaller operations, the 200 Paul operation. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that big switching center here at Meat Point in uh, San Francisco for a number of internet companies and so forth. That is connected with fiber. Fiber uh, special access is the regulatory term, is the middle mile that sort of laces up the internet. Uh, these middle mile became very key in the AT&T T-Mobile merger when we realized that the largest, the, the real bottleneck control of the wireless network is that wire that backhauls into the network from the cell site. So your wireless phone is only wireless in that first mile to the cell site and it goes into wire and back into the network and guess who owns those wires? So why is this a problem? Uh, there's uh, something called the protocol stack. Control of the wires gives you control of this protocol stack. And at the bottom of the stack are the wire, is the so-called physical layer. Uh, this is the uh, wires, the uh, towers, the conduit, etc. Uh, if you control that layer, this is a quote from a guy named Richard Witt. I hope that all is showing there. Uh, Richard Witt is uh, counsel to Google now. He was formerly with MCI. He's one of these guys that really knows the network. And entities control over the physical layer and its resulting control over higher layers leads to a situation where he who controls the lower layers, i.e. he who controls the wires, or it that controls the wires, can't control the dependent upper layers, including applications and content. And what this translates to is that the network owners can slow speech, they can choose preferred speech. Um, as we'll see, what they really want is what's called a two-sided market. 
so why is this a problem? 200 million US internet users are not in the picture. Verizon is at, as I said earlier, the uh, DC circuit, and this is going to the Supreme Court. This will be at the Supreme Court by the end of 2013. They are arguing that they, as a network, as a speaker, network speaker, network owner, see this confusion of ownership and speech, uh, that they have a First Amendment right to control the internet. Um, so they've done, uh, they've been caught, the networks have been caught, slowing traffic down, not disclosing that to customers, uh, discriminating uh, uh, among traffic. I, I imagine you folks are uh, familiar with the narrow uh, National Abortion Rights Group sent out emails that were censored by Verizon. Um, the uh, uh, Pearl Jam was giving a concert uh, on an AT&T network and Eddie, I, I hope I've got the name right here, Eddie Vedder's rant against George Bush was cut off midstream because they didn't feel it was appropriate. And this actually goes back to where I met Steve. We had the same situation with Viacom back in the day as a cable company deciding that certain programming on the public uh, access channel was not appropriate. Uh, so they've been caught, they've been caught discriminating and blocking content and so the FCC adopted three rules, non-discrimination, non-blocking, no blocking, and transparency. If you're slowing certain traffic down, you have to tell people. You have to tell people if you do, you know, over so many gigabits a, a month, we're going to start slowing you down. That has to be right out there and clear so you know what you're buying. Um, these three rules are very vanilla. They did not take the next step, which was simply to redeclare broadband as a common carrier like phone used to be. Uh, very weak vanilla rules, uh, and as a result, they're vulnerable to appeal. Uh, they have been appealed. Um, and this again, is, this is the quote more of the kind of quotes I was reading at the beginning. Uh, the FCC's order uh, infringes on our First Amendment rights, says uh, Verizon. Uh, it's, our, it's our microphone. And I mean, when you think about that, it's, it's just really amazing that uh, they are essentially claiming the speech of, of, of you all as their own. Um, so, going ahead again, 200 million U.S. Uh, internet users not in the picture, no, no rights for them. And I should say I'm, I'm publishing, uh, I've got an article coming out uh, later this month on developing the information rights of, of information recipients as opposed to speakers, so network users as opposed to network owners. So what they really want is the so-called two-sided market. They want to be able to charge Google and Facebook and Netflix to reach you. And this is the most paradigmatic and clear on, um, on the cable side where uh, the cable companies are charging the Comcast, uh, charging Netflix they're attempting to charge Netflix to get on to the broadband platform that the cable operator is carrying. It completely destroys the, the non-discriminatory open internet. Um, I, I won't go through this with all of you, but Cisco and other companies, and I can uh, provide this um, PowerPoint to anyone who wants it, uh, they advertise that they can slow down traffic, that they can monetize traffic, that they can make your content sticky. Uh, Cisco is the company, one of the main suppliers of the uh, equipment that AT&T and Verizon and Comcast will use to discriminate 
among and between traffic. All right, so how did we get here? A series of bad decisions by the FCC. Uh, and this is my, my boss's metaphor, uh, a woman, Helen Miskevich, who's been an activist in this area for a long time. What the FCC essentially said was that that icon on your desk, that application on your desktop, and the pipe that brings the information to that icon are one in the same service, and it's an information service, not a transportation service. I know that sounds real geeky, uh, but uh, by classifying it as an information service, it, they essentially deregulated broadband pipe. And it was a little linguistic tri trick. Even uh, Justice Scalia thought it was too clever by half. Uh, the famous pizza analogy, uh, he says it's like a pizza guy de denying that he provides delivery because what we, when we bring a pizza to your house, we are not actually offering you delivery uh, because the delivery we provide to our end users is part and parcel of our pizzeria pizza at home service. Uh, so probably the one time I agreed with Justice Scalia in my professional life. Uh, and then I can go through the bad FCC decisions. This, all of this happens in the arcane backwaters of FCC uh, telecom, largely communications cases, proceedings, dockets at the FCC. Um, so why is treating the broadband, the pizza broadband delivery uh, the same as, or, or differently than telecom service uh, why does that make no sense? And this is this the, uh, the formatting. There's a lot of stuff here that you're not seeing. Um, this is a diagram essentially of, of how a DSL wire comes into your house. A DSL and phone comes in on the same wire, and yet the phone is treated as a common carrier. The DSL broadband, courtesy of this weird decision that Scalia talked about is not. It's, uh, the, the broadband part of that is, is a quote-unquote information service that's really hardly regulated at all. Um, and what we're talking about is common carriage. You know, the good old telephone, the separation of the conduit from the content. You know, in the old days, Pac Bell would never think of, of prioritizing one phone call over another. Um, why shouldn't all transport be treated equally? No discrimination, no blocking, no lower level control. Uh, what we want is an uninfluenced, unguided culture. We, what we don't want is an AT&T mall. And that's what you're going to get if the uh, telcos have their way. They will have their preferred providers. And when you uh, Google rent a car, you're going to get Hertz and not Avis will be nowhere to be found. Um, why does this matter? I think Larry Lessig said it best. The architecture of the internet, as it is right now, is perhaps the most important model of free speech since the founding. Um, and I agree with that. That's what makes your work as union activists possible, is having this unmediated, uh, undominated communications network. And that is in danger now. It's in danger on a number of different levels. You heard uh, Mr. Stallman this morning. Uh, we talked about the ITU. Uh, I was uh, talking to Dorothy about SB 1161 that just passed in California. This is a bill that prevents my agency from having any oversight, really any oversight, over any IP-enabled service might sound innocuous, but the whole telephone network today is IP enabled. So it's essentially the deregulation of this network that brings you the internet. Um, it's a conflict of interest. You can't own both the conduit and the content, especially when owning the conduit allows you to control the content of others. Um, and, and by the way, that was the that was what was going on with railroads at the end of the 19th century. That's why we have a public utilities commission. It was initially called the Railroad Commission because of 
the discriminatory practices and, and, and bottleneck wealth extraction that the railroads engaged in. Um, solutions, um, not that these are in the realm of the politically doable in this country, but in England, they required British Telecom to spin off its wires, the last mile and middle mile, to a separate division called Open Reach. This is uh, called functional separation. Uh, the FCC had, back in the late 80s and early 90s, called for structural separation. In other words, if AT&T wanted to be in any information market, they had to set up an entirely different corporation. Um, so when uh, the British regulatory agency required British Telecom to spin off its wires, guess what happened? An explosion of competition. Broadband rates went down, choice went up, uh, speed went up, and this is this, this is kind of a geeky diagram here of what they did. They took that last mile to the home and the middle mile, and the, that's what they put in this sort of regulated wholesale only company that would, would then sell that network access to all comers, including their own retail division, on equal terms. Oops. Okay. Um, so this is sort of the uh, uh, top to bottom of, of the remedies that one can apply to prevent discrimination on the internet, beginning with this weak vanilla net neutrality rules at the top, and then at the bottom, a complete ban on any cross-ownership between conduit and content. Essentially telling the telcos, okay, your job is to provide a communications network, and that's all you're gonna do. Uh, whether or not uh, our decision makers will have the political will to do that is, is a question. So that's that's it, essentially. it's. Uh, uh, briefs just went in at the DC circuit. I, anyone who's interested, I have all the briefs, um, including briefs from Tim Wu and, and others. Good, good stuff. Some of it. Um, so there you have it. Thank you, Chris. Um, okay, uh, our next speaker is. Uh, Todd Davies. Todd is uh, one of the organizing committees for Labor Tech and also is a lecturer at Stanford University and has been fighting for democratic use of the internet and communication software for working people. So, uh, before I bring him up here, let me get back to the Labor Tech. So, welcome, Todd. Todd Davies. Um, I think, yeah, maybe all right, I, I'm gonna, I think I have to plug in something. Okay. You wanna plug in this? We'll take this off. Yeah. Okay. So, so we'll just set the, uh, the adapter to do this. Okay. Oh, you wanna take this? Steve? Yeah. Will we be able to ask these guys questions after the three yes. presentations? Yes, there'll be questions after the three presentations. Yeah, we're going to pull it out. He's going to put this together. I don't know, maybe, um, I can't find my adapter. Maybe that was just a question. This is just a show. Yeah, that's not going to work. I'm going to just pull it together. Thank <laughs> you. 